Hi, Pastor Marshall here from Laidley Baptist Church again for our weekly podcast. We're working through the book of Romans at the moment and today we're up to Romans chapter 6, Sunday the 13th of September. Romans 6, and if you've been with us for the last five or six weeks, you'll recognise the fact that we've been looking at justification. This week we're going to look at sanctification, and so I'll be explaining the differences between those in our message in just a minute. We also uh, want to invite you to look at all of our other podcasts on our website. So go to Laidley Baptist, go to YouTube, search for Laidley Baptist, and you will find them all. All right, well, let's get into this. Let's pray and let's get into this, eh? Let's pray. God, thank you for today. We thank you for looking after us, for providing for us. We thank you for your provision, for your sovereignty in our lives. Lord, just open our minds and our hearts now to your word as we learn from what you've got to teach each one of us today. In Jesus' name we come. Amen. So today is Romans chapter 6, and we're going to read it a little in a little while. And it is a fairly um, theological chapter, but Paul, up to this point, as I said, for the first five chapters, he's been talking about justification, and he moves on. So in other words, just as if I'd never sinned. In other words, what has happened with our past life of sin We've now come to Christ. Sanctification is the next part in the process. And he's explaining this to a young church in the city of Rome. Obviously, they'd never had any apostle visit them before, so they don't know all these great theological foundations. And so Paul is bringing those things and trying to explain them to this church. Sanctification, what is it? It's essentially what God is doing in our lives to ensure that we are growing and becoming more Christ-like great picture behind me of the potter in the potter's wheel and it looks like a father or a grandfather's hands around the hands of a child trying to form something beautiful essentially that is the process of sanctification in our lives for some people sanctification is a longer process it is a long process in in fact it happens for the entirety of our lives but for some people there's more discipline involved than others some people it comes easy others a little less easy. So let's get into Romans chapter 6. Let's have a quick look. As usual, every week I run through a number of slides on the screen so that you can understand if you're coming in for the first time. Last week we spoke about, and over the last couple of weeks, we spoke about that while we were still sinners, while we were still enemies, while we were still uh, alienated from God, Christ came at the right time. God sent his son to die for our sins. And so we looked at that last week, so you can check out our podcast from last week, the 6th of September. And so this week, Paul's main mantra is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation, everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So let's, uh, let's keep a, a bit of a, a quick run through this recap. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at, for all of sin, we looked at the first couple of chapters of Romans, and it tells us in Romans that there is enough there to convict us of our sin, but there is not enough for it to save us. And so, it, we, for all of sin and fallen short. Uh, the background situation of Paul's epistle is that he's writing it to this young church, AD 57, and he writes it uh, from uh, Corinth, uh, Corinth and, and so to Christian believers in Rome. Uh, First eight chapters, what to believe, the next three, God's relationship, and then we're going to talk about how to behave. The high point is Romans 12, 1 and 2. Take your every day, walking around, eating, sleeping, working, playing life, and put on the altar as a living sacrifice before God. So um, we'll jump through all of these screens here. And so it's the first book of systematic theology. Paul puts down all of this theology in one letter. And we've got a record of that. It's the book of Romans, and he writes it to this church. He's never visited the church in Rome to this point. All right, we've said in the past few weeks that no one's saved just by just going out there and living the Christian life. We've got to speak it. We've got to know what it is. What is the content of the gospel? It must be proclaimed, and it is Christ crucified. Christ crucified, buried, and raised again on the third day according to the Scriptures. The whole book of Romans is about salvation, and that's what we're going to talk about. So in the book of Romans, it's got three major words and then we go and we've been working through the first word justification and it's all about our past aspect of sin in our lives and when we've come to Christ we're going to start this week on the second word which is sanctification and it's about what God's doing presently in our lives as a believer and then of course down the track as we get further through Romans we'll talk about 
the future, which is glorification or perfection in Christ. So let's keep working through those things. We've talked about the Roman road to salvation, a range of passages that leads us and helps us understand our condition of justification, but also what God is doing to sanctify us. So we'll, we'll jump through that. Very quickly, the first couple of chapters, we've talked about the pagans, the Jews, the Gentiles, and the revelation that everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's glory. That's Romans 3.23. But God showed his faithfulness that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then in chapter 4, we looked at what does it mean to trust God? And last week, what are the results of us being saved, our justification? You can go back and check those out on our podcasts. We're going to stop now and we're going to have a listen to Romans chapter 6. It'll come up on the screen and we're going to go through Romans chapter 6. So let's pause while we do that now. All right, we're back. Chapter 6. It's pretty heavy going, isn't it? Romans 6 is heavy stuff. So um, let's try and explain it a little bit for you. I know Romans is a really deep book, and so what I'm trying to do is make it easy, but still at the same time have lots of meat in it so that we don't miss what the Apostle Paul is really trying to say through this. The first, basically the first uh, 10 verses or 14 verses, he talks about the basis of our justification. Justification. 
And so what he's saying is he wants to tell us, first of all, the difference between what justification is and sanctification. So the first thing is, is that justification deals with the problem of the guilt of our sin. But sanctification deals with the problem of the power of sin. When we become believers, sin is still there. It's still an issue, but it's about how we deal with the problem of the power of sin in our lives. How do we actually counter that? And so we'll talk more about that in just a minute. But the problem of the guilt of sin, well, let's go back to justification, has been met. And the solution to guilt is justification. In other words, God declares us righteous. That when we accept Christ, he has declared us righteous because of God's, uh, Jesus' finished work on the cross. So these next three chapters, chapters 6 to 8, has got some sort of unity. You could sort of put a parenthesis around them. They deal with the element, this one element of sanctification. So let's summarize chapters 6 to 8 with a couple of one-liners. Chapter 6, it teaches us why we never have to sin again. Chapter 7, even if we try not to sin, we will. And chapter 8, we never have to sin again because of the Holy Spirit. We will, we will fall into sin. We can sin, but we don't have to sin because of the Holy Spirit. So that's the next three chapters. So the emphasis is now on living this justified life. We must live it in union with Jesus Christ. Justification declares us righteous. If we were in a court of law and we did something wrong, the judge would actually find that we weren't guilty and he would declare us righteous or free, that we would be saved, we could walk out of the courthouse. But sanctification has for its purpose in our lives now as believers to make us holy. That's the job of sanctification. That's God's job, to make us holy. And chapter 6 revolves around these two questions. The first one is contained in verse 1, and it says this, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? It's in a present tense. In other words, it deals with this continual habitual sinning. In other words, shall we habitually keep on sinning so that God's grace may abound and increase? And Paul answers that in verses 2 to 14. But there's, there's a second question. The second question is, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? And here Paul uses a totally different tense. In the Greek, it's this tense called aorist tense. It's translated, this, this particular question here that he asks in verse 15 means this. It says, can we sin occasionally? If not habitually, can we sin just occasionally? And Paul answers this question from verse 15 in verses 16 to 23. And the whole of chapter 6 surrounds these two questions. Naturally, the whole point that Paul's going to make is continuing in, is sin, in sin is impossible for the justified man because of his union with Christ. Even acts of sin are unwarranted because of the position that we now find ourselves in. Now, at no point should we confuse this with the concept that in this life we can become sinless. That's an incorrect theology. Each one of us have fallen short. We each are born into sin. We each have a sin nature. And, and Paul teaches the opposite of, of this sinless nature. The basis of our sanctification is our identification with Christ. So in verse 1 he says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And it's a logical question that comes out of the stuff that he's been saying in the previous five chapters. And if you have ever preached or have ever heard preached salvation on the basis of grace alone, apart from works, that you're saved by faith plus nothing, eventually this sort of question is going to come up. Because if we really believe that we're saved purely by grace... In other words, if we can do no work to earn our salvation, and that's what Paul's teaching, then we can do no work to lose it either. If our salvation comes by grace, then our continuance in the eternal life also comes by grace as well. Now, whenever anyone teaches uh, what this concept's known as eternal security, whenever, whenever anyone teaches eternal security that we are eternally secure in Jesus Christ and that we cannot lose our salvation then someone's going to always ask the question that is being asked here in verse 1 of chapter 6. So, does that mean I can do anything I want to now? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? In other words, God is a forgiving God. And the more we sin, the more we actually show how, how forgiving and how gracious God is. So why don't we sin more? If we look at our lives and we think, well, yesterday I committed 
oh, 247 sins. Well, why don't we sin more today so that we can actually see God's glory and his forgiveness and his grace even more? And that's the question here that's really being asked in verse 1. Shall we continue in sin so that God's grace may abound even more? But the fact that the same objection is raised to the teaching of security now, as it was in Paul's day, shows that we're still preaching the theology of Paul today. Now, the word he uses there is continue in sin. It's a present tense. In other words, it, it emphasizes habitual behavior. Paul does not challenge the conclusion, which is the more we sin, the more grace will cover it. Because that is true. God doesn't matter how much sin we commit. God's grace will always cover it. That's true. But he, so he doesn't challenge that. But the more we believe we sin, the more grace will cover it. Paul doesn't challenge that. But what he does challenge is this. It's the concept that we are given this free license to sin as much as we want just because we're covered by grace. So the answer to this question comes in verse 2. And Paul basically says the same thing to both of these questions. In verse 1, he's talking about habitual sin. But in verse 15, he's talking about just the occasional sin. You know, this the white lie you get by, just this little one or whatever. But Paul's got the same answer to both questions. And he says... Now that we have salvation, does that mean we can do whatever we want? And Paul says, absolutely not, by no means. That would be crazy. Perish the thought, he's saying. It's one of the strongest objections in the Greek language that you'll find in the Bible. Why should we perish the thought is the question that someone might ask. Well, it answers that. It says, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? That's what verse 2 says. Because of our union with Jesus Christ, we are now reckoned as dead to sin. In relationship to sin, as a believer, we are dead. In relation to sin, the believer died. But how did he die? Verse 3 says, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might live or may live a new life. And it's because of our union with this death, burial and resurrection of Christ that we are looking upon or we are looked upon as being united with Jesus in such a way that we are dead to sin. Now, the baptism that Paul is talking about here, he's not talking about the baptism of water. Why not? Because water doesn't have this much power. OK, this is he's talking about spirit baptism. When does spirit baptism happen? It's at the point of when a believer believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are baptized at that point immediately by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And that comes out more clearly if you want to go and check that out in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. The Holy Spirit upon our faith has baptized us into the body of Christ. And now we are reckoned or looked upon by God as so united to Christ so that when he died, we died. So that when he was buried, we were buried. When he was resurrected, we were resurrected. And the reason we are now dead to sin is because we were considered as co-crucified with Jesus Christ. And as a result, we now have a new type of life and verse 4 says this, and we should habitually walk now in this new type of life. Let's have a look at verse 5. It says, for if we have been united with him in death like this, he will certainly also be united, or we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. Now, since if we've been united with Christ, and that's called, in theology terms, it's called the first class condition. If we've been united with Christ, and we were, Therefore, we are in a brand new position altogether. And if we're in the likeness of his death, we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So the resurrection of Christ meant for Jesus. You think about it. His resurrection meant that he had a brand new life. He was no longer limited by a body that earlier had been very mortal. Now he has an immortal body. He was resurrected and he lives a different kind of life now than when he did prior to his death. And his crucifixion in the same sense since you and i have been co-crucified co-buried and co-resurrected we should also be living this new kind of life the way that we know that we can live a new kind of life is because the power of the old man is broken now what does that mean what does the power of the old man mean what's he talking about 
Verse 6 says, For we know that our old man or our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. The term old man is another term for our sin nature. The emphasis is what we were in Adam. Back in the garden, sin crept in, and as a result, it's been passed down the line, generation to generation, and that's our sin nature, the old man. What we were in Adam was crucified on the cross by Jesus, so that the old body, the old sin nature, which was the instrument in our body through which this sin nature operated, that body has now died. And this is what Paul's trying to say. He's saying sin as king has no longer any authority over us. We've died to it. We've been freed from the old nature by Jesus Christ. The old nature no longer has any legal right over us. Yeah, sure, we may surrender to it every now and then, but we may give into it, but it, it has no legal rights over us. It cannot demand our actions any more as it did once. Before we were believers, everything we did, doesn't matter how good or religious it might have seen, was still under the power of this one master, the sin nature. But now, as believers, you and I have been co-crucified with Christ. We are a new creation. We're a new being. The sin nature is there, but it has no authority over us. We can give in to it. We often do, but it has no legal right over us. The whole picture has changed. And in verses 8 to 10, in verses 8 to 10, as a result, we have entered a new sphere of life. In verse 8, the union with Jesus Christ has not only taken care of our guilt, as it did in verse 7, but it has delivered us from sin's power. Now, what is sin's power? What is sin's power? Sin's power is obviously the wages of sin is death. But you and I have died to sin. We have become liberated from the power of sin. And verse 9 is the proof of it. All right. And so um, we're going to have a look at that in just a second. If Christ died, remember, we died. If Christ was resurrected, and he certainly was, then you and I have been resurrected. And Christ will die no more. Death no longer has any authority over Christ. You know, there's a great passage in Corinthians where it talks about death, where is your sting? You know, death no longer has any power over us. No victory. The sin nature has no longer any authority over us. And in verse 10, Paul explains it. He says, the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. All right. So this, this factor here is, um, I think I've got the wrong verse number on the screen. It should say verse 10. Christ only died once and we're only going to be justified once. We've been justified once. Once and for all. But the process now that we're talking about from chapter 6 onward is this process of sanctification. And that's an ongoing process. We don't pick it up when we read chapter 6, but in the Greek tense, it's an aorist tense. And as a result, it's this continual process that as Christ continually lives, now having died once, so can we. So the first 10 verses in this chapter is really heavy going theological stuff. It, but it gives us the truth of the fact that we are in Jesus Christ. It's a fact. And Paul's saying, these first 10 verses, reckon this to be true. Now, we use the word reckon in a different way. We might say, are oh, you going down to Woolworths? Yeah, I reckon. That's not the, per the context of which Paul uses it. It's actually a, a different term. It's used here in a sense that you can count on it to be true. It can be reckoned. In other words, it's a mathematical term. If you add all these calculations up, you get one answer. And that's what Paul's saying here. It's a mathematical term. In fact, this reckoning. It's like punching letters into uh, numbers into a calculator. You know what sort of results you're going to get. And Paul's saying this here, that this is the result. This can be true. This is reckoned to be true. Learning to live a daily life in accordance with Christ is continuous. All right? So consider it to be true. A uh, fact that has been presented now in these 10 verses, we're told to believe it. We are to have continuous attitude of faith that it's true because we did die to sin. The sin nature living in me no longer has authority or power over me. I died to it. So it has no legal grounds to claim me anymore. And so we need to reckon that to be true, according to Paul. That's what he's asking us to do. So what is true of Christ then is true of us because of our union with him. Paul is drawing a conclusion out of these first 10 verses. And he says, in the same way, Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. 
So a quick summary of what we've sort of covered in these first 11 verses is this. Paul's presented a fact, and we're asked to believe that fact, and we are to consider it to be true and so. And it represents our attitude, an attitude that should be a fact, not of feeling. All right. So he's trying to actually get them to understand fact, not this faith by feeling scenario. So it means to conclude after making this, these, these calculations, and as a result of the cal- calculations, consider it to be so, consider it to be true. All right. That when Christ died, we died. That when Christ rose, we rose. And that's what he wants us to reckon as true. So that when, when sin suddenly comes onto the scene, when it makes its appearance, we are to recognize it and reckon ourselves to be dead to it, but alive in, in God. We are to conclude of ourselves that God has already declared us to be dead to sin. God has declared us to be righteous through Christ. Sin no longer has any authority, no power, no authority over us. It's this present imperative. It's a command. It emphasizes something that we need to keep on doing, that we should keep on reckoning this to be true, that we are dead to sin. So what's true of Jesus is true of us because of our union described in these first 10 verses. So in whatever sense that Christ is dead to sin, in that sense, we are dead to sin. In whatever sense that Christ was raised, we are raised. And for that reason, we are acceptable to God. All right, if you want to check that out, there's a, uh, a great verse in 2 Corinthians 5.17. You can go and check that out. That's a, a bit of homework. You can press the pause and go and have a look at it. The reason why God is totally free to accept us is because we are so identified with Jesus in his death and his resurrection so that as far as our position in Jesus Christ is concerned, what is true of him is automatically true now of us as believers. The difference between our position And our experience is that positionally, what God says of us is true because of what we are in Jesus Christ. But in our experience, our obligation now is to continue to grow until we conform to what we are positionally. All right. The content of what we are to reckon as true is that we are dead to sin, but we are alive to God through Jesus Christ. That's the whole point of sanctification, to know your position in Christ But sanctification is the process of taking you to believe exactly where uh, the scriptures, what Paul is trying to say to us in Christ. The content of what we are to reckon as true is that we are dead to sin and we are alive to God through Christ. So the result of this co-crucifixion concept that Paul has in the first 10 verses is that we are forever forgiven for all of our sins, forever forgiven for what we are, And we are forever forgiven for all of our sin. Now, that's a great, great uh, concept or teaching that Paul has for us and also for the church in Rome. We are forever made acceptable for the Holy Spirit to dwell within us. Now, the practical truth of this is that sin can never cause us to be rejected. Sin can never cause the Holy Spirit to leave us. Can I say that again? Sin can never cause the Holy Spirit to leave us. That is what Paul's trying to teach here. Now, that's a great concept as well. So these first 10 or 11 verses are basic theological truths. But in verse verse 11, we're to respond by reckoning that what Paul has said is to be true. But then in verses 12 and 14, we're going to move on. Um, Having reckoned that to be true, we're therefore told how we are to yield accordingly. All right. And he says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. All right so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness for sin shall no longer be your master because you're not under the law, but under grace. You know, it's a practical command, isn't it? Do not let sin reign in your bodies. That's verse 12. And we've got to apply that doctrine. It's a once and for all experience. But it's not a once only yield. We are to keep on yielding. We should keep on not letting sin reign as king in our mortal bodies. Because if we do, the natural call out of that, if we let sin reign in our bodies, the natural call out of that is to obey the lusts thereof. So the sin here is the sin nature. You and I have this sin nature. If we're left to that, we know that we will no longer yield to it anymore. 
So in verse 13, we are not to yield our bodies to sin. All right. We are not to let this body that we possess become instruments for sin and for the sin nature to use. Because if we yield our physical body to the sin nature, then the sin nature begins to rule over us. It becomes our master. We're no longer, we're told by Paul in verses 1 to 10, we are no longer under its authority. We're to make sure that we are continually not presenting our bodies to the sin nature. However, we are to continually present our bodies to the new nature to present it for God's use. So these words that Paul uses, present or offer yourselves, in the second part is that same Greek tense I talked about earlier. It's a continuation, a continual process every day, every minute, continually offering our bodies, presenting our bodies um, and making sure that we don't present it to the sin nature, but we are once and for all committing them to God and yielding to God continually. So we've made this once and for all commitment to Christ and that this body is now to be used by God alone. We are then to act and live accordingly. And I mean, this is one of the high points that Paul has. Romans 12 is about placing our bodies. It's about what we do with our bodies and placing it as a living sacrifice upon the altar for God to use. Our life is to be lived in accordance with that once and for all commitment that we've made. So on one hand, we continually fight against subjecting our bodies to be used by the sin nature. But on the other hand, you know, and it, because it's a continuous warfare, sin's going to try and trap us all the time. It's a continuous battle. And so just because we're a Christian, because we're a believer, doesn't mean Satan leaves us alone. doesn't mean that sin doesn't tempt us. But on the other hand, we are to make this once and for all commitment of our bodies to God and for his use alone. We are to be alive unto God and to live this resurrected life for Christ. So then in verse 14, yeah, so he says, don't let your body become an instrument of sin. Sin shall no longer be our master. All right, that's a good, so, you know, we're all slaves, but the question is for me, are we slaves to God's righteousness or are we slaves to sin and the sin nature? Verse 14, Paul explains, and he also makes a promise. He says, for sin shall no longer be your master because you're not under the law, but under grace. And this verse sets the pace for the rest of this chapter, chapter six. Sin is not to exercise any authority over us. However, Paul's going to expand this later in chapter seven. That's next week. That if we try to work our Christian life under the principle of law, all that can happen is we're going to quickly fall into that sin nature. But of course, he's saying we're not under the law, we're under grace. And the principle of law will only bring us into servitude under sin. But the principle of grace gives us power. It gives us a desire to live a holy life. So the point of Romans 6, uh, as we summarize, is that we, have, we never have to sin again. And we may, but we don't have to. Verses 1 to 14 answered that question. Now, the second question is raised in light of what Paul has just said in verse 14, that we're not under law as believers in Jesus. We're under grace. And he says, what then shall we sin because we're not under the law, but we're under grace? In other words, he's saying he's saying, you know, we're under God's grace. Surely we can sin. Doesn't really matter anymore. God will forgive us. He's a forgiving God. But it's a little bit different than the question asked in verse one. In verse one, it was the present tense. But now it's about, in other words, this present tense about Shall we continue sinning? And the answer to that one was by no means. But now in verse 15, he's saying, shall we sin just if we cannot continuously keeping, keep on sinning that grace may abound? Can we just commit these occasional sins, periodic acts of sin? You know, you blow it every now and then. Are we allowed at least that much? That's what this question is saying in verse 15. Can we commit isolated acts of sin over and against Perhaps, you know, the contrast of habitual sin. And the reason it's raised here is that Paul just said that we are no longer under the law and its condemnation of sins. And since we're no longer under the condemnation of sins, because we're no longer under the law, then may we simply commit isolated sins. You know, you know the, the white lie. What about a white lie? You know, can we get away with it? And Paul answers exactly the same way as he answered the first question in verse 1. Absolutely not. By no means. Forget it. Perish the thought. And so we say, well, why perish the thought again? Verse 16, he says, we're no longer slaves of sin. We are slaves 
of righteousness. He says, don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You've been set free from sin and you're now slaves to righteousness. So the question he's trying to say is, well, which one do you want to choose? Which one's your master? Verse 16 says, we've been freed from the slave market of sin. And the principle is that we are slaves to whom we obey and whom we serve. If we continue serving sin, well, then we'll once again come under this slavery to sin from which we've been freed through the cross. But if we serve righteousness, then we become slaves of righteousness. We are a slave to that which we obey and to that which we present ourselves. So you've got to ask the question, what do you present yourself? What's your body doing? Which one are you a slave to? Which one do you obey? Are we slaves to righteous? My wife has got set up these wonderfully big keys here. You know, if, if, if you're a slave, I guess, you know, you, you certainly have to serve a master. And up until Christ came on the cross, we only ever had one master, and that was the master of sin. That was all we had on this, this earth, this life. We had this hope of death. That was it. When Christ came to die for us and he took away all the sins on our, our sins on the cross, past, present and future, all of a sudden God has given us another option. We now no longer are slaves to sin. We are now considered and declared righteous and we can choose to become slaves to righteousness. Now, I don't know if you know much about bond servants, but a bond servant is one who, when he gets to the end of his indenture as a slave, and the Jewish, uh, certainly the Jewish culture had a, a culture of freeing slaves every a number of years. Um, once you got to the end of that term, you were free to go. Or you had an option to stay bonded to your master. If you really liked your master, you could stay as a bond slave to that master, which meant that instead of being a slave, you were now considered part of the family as a son. And so that's the difference. And Paul's trying to draw this contrast. He's trying to actually help us understand what he's trying to say here, that there's this contrast. There's two options now. There's only ever been two options of masters to humanity, slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness. But in verses 17 to 23, Paul wants to point out or bring out that there's a way of life which operates. There's a principle or a way of life which operates so that disobedience leads to slavery and sin. But obedience to righteousness leads to slavery of righteousness. Slaves to righteousness. And it's a way of life. And in verses 17 and 18, the emphasis is on their state. At one time they were servants of sin. But then the gospel came and they accepted the gospel and they were delivered from it. And they became obedient from the heart. And they exercised the obedience of faith which saves. Verse 17 says this, But thanks be to God that you used to be slave to sin. To sin. You have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. And the word here that Paul uses, he uses this word pattern. Uh, it's to do with this deeply ingrained image which can reproduce its image in us. The teaching is that through Jesus Christ, we have been freed from the slavery of sin. That's the teaching. But then what he's saying is there's, there's this pattern and it can reproduce itself in our daily living. Once we know what the pattern is, it can reproduce itself. It's deeply ingrained. And so uh, we can, on a daily basis, be slaves of righteousness and no longer slaves of sin. We've been freed from that marketplace of sin through the redemption of sin when we accepted the gospel. But now that, we, now that can reproduce itself in our day-to-day -day living. All right? And that's what he's trying to say. He's trying to say you don't have to actually um, be enslaved to sin. You now have this deeply ingrained pattern of being slaves to righteousness. It's an alternative new way of life. And in verse 19, Paul presents an illustration. He says this, I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourself as slaves to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness. So now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. 
So they're still at a point where they do not fully comprehend all of these spiritual truths that Paul's talking about. And he's presenting them. And, and, and that's the reason why Paul resorts to using this illustration. He says, in your unsaved state, before you knew who Jesus was, you used to present your bodies as instruments or servants of uncleanness and impurity. But now that you've been freed from that impurity, the slavery to the sin nature, because you've accepted Jesus Christ, what you ought to do now is present your bodies as servants of righteousness for the purposes of God sanctifying you. The purpose of sanctification. All right. Presenting our bodies as servants or slaves of righteousness. That's what sanctification is. By the process of sanctification, this church, us as believers, can become more and more conformed to the image of the Son of God. I don't know about you in your life, but that's where I want to go. I want to be a slave to righteousness. I do want to be conformed into the image of God's Son. And as believers, we still have the option. So although the sin nature no longer has any legal authority over us, we can sometimes of our own free will still submit to it. So the believer, having been freed from the slavery of sin, doesn't mean he can no longer sin, but he's got an option. He can either submit himself against his sin nature and once again be enslaved to it. That happens to all of us. Or he can submit himself to the righteousness of God and become a slave of righteousness. Okay, So we can be enslaved to sin or we can be enslaved to righteousness. And every one of these two options, both these options have consequences. And in verse 20 to 22, Paul talks about it. He says, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time, though, from the things that you are now ashamed of? These things only result in death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness. And the result? eternal life. So one consequence is the consequence of enslavement to sin. That before they became believers, that was their only option. Everything that they did was on the basis of this sin nature. The fruit that they produced in accordance with this sin nature is the very things that now, as believers, they're ashamed of. Now, if they should again submit themselves to the sin nature, having been freed from it, then they will again, once again, start producing the type of works that they will again be ashamed of later. So there's a warning there by Paul. However, on the other side of the coin, if they submit themselves to be slaves of righteousness, then guess what? Righteousness produces righteousness. It will do two things. If we submit ourselves and our bodies to be used by the new nature, two things will happen. Number one, it'll speed up our process of sanctification in this life. You want a rough road? Then don't submit. Keep getting sucked back into the sin nature and back and forwards and back and forwards. But let me tell you, if you want to speed up the process of sanctification, continue to offer your body as a slave of righteousness to the Lord. The second thing is a consequence of being enslaved to righteousness is it will produce eternal life in the end. Whereas the other one only produces death. One way or another, we know that in our life as a believer, sanctification will come because sanctification is guaranteed to every believer. The problem comes in how much discipline do you want to go through? How much discipline will it take from God for the sanctification process to, to be completed. And that's your choice. God gives you the option. We're not robots. He gives us a free will to make those choices. Verse 23, the last verse in chapter 6, here it is, great verse. It's a general law of God's moral universe. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, the Greek word for wages that Paul uses here is this concept has to do with a soldier being paid by a general, by a master to a servant. And it has, has to do with a daily payment rather than a weekly or a monthly or an annual payment. And, and Paul is saying now the daily wages paid by sin, the general or the master of sin, ultimately will lead only one way to death. But notice here that he never says the eternal life is a wage. Eternal life is not a wage. It's not something that you can earn. 
It's not something that, you know, you think you, you are owed. Eternal life is a free gift from God. And that's the general law of God's moral universe, that the wages of sin, the more that you work for sin, the ultimate payment, all that you get is death. But Paul is saying you can be free from all that by simply accepting a free gift from God. That's as simple as it is. That's all we have to do. We can't earn it. It's not a wage. God gives it as a free gift. All we have to do is gratefully accept the free gift of eternal life from God. So the point of chapter 6, as I said earlier, is that you never have to sin again. But the point of chapter 7, and we'll look at this next week, is going to seem to contradict that. If we try not to sin, guess what? We will. But the solution comes in chapter 8. That's in the next two weeks. And one of my, fa that my favorite verse in all of the scriptures is in Romans chapter 8, verse 38 to 39. I'm not going to go into it now. We'll look at that in two weeks' time. Okay, what about the application? Here's the challenge. God is a forgiving God, right? Yeah, we all agree on that. Well, then why not give him more to forgive? Wrong. Even though our forgiveness is, is guaranteed by God, Paul is saying it doesn't give us a license to keep us sinning as much as we want. Obviously, if we do, we don't understand the seriousness or the gravity of our sin. Our sin was the reason that Jesus hung on the cross. That was the reason he suffered and bled and died on the cross for us, for you, for our sins. So we mustn't live careless lives because of the cross. And that's what Paul's trying to say. Yes, we're covered by grace. But if you understood the gravity of sin in your life, you wouldn't continue to sin. Our old nature, the sin nature, is now buried with Christ. All of our sinful desires are to be treated as though they're dead. Because we're now united with Christ, all of that is buried with him. And there's something new. It's a brand new, wonderful life with Christ. Sin's power over us, gone, once and for all, done at the cross. Sin no longer has a hold on us, hallelujah. That through our faith in Christ and his work on the cross, that we can stand righteous before God, that we're no longer slaves to sin. You and I now have a choice. We can now live for Christ. This choice affects everything that we do, every moment of every waking day, of every day in our lives. The assurance that we don't have to fear death, the wages of sin, anymore everything changes it's a new life it's a fresh start the holy spirit is helping you and i to become all that christ wants us to be so let me ask you this question it's on the screen how do we stop letting sin control our lives this is a really important question you know as believers we get stuck in this we think that every time we sin we let god down and that we got to start all over again no but this question is important. How do we stop letting sin control our lives? Right. Here's a couple of ideas. Ask yourself, what are your personal weaknesses? Where will you be tempted? Where will Satan try and corner you? Where do you think that Satan's going to try and get to you? So you've got to ask those questions. What are my personal weaknesses? Is it this? Is it that? Is it pleasing people? Is it this is it an addiction is it what are your personal weaknesses get to know what they are you, only every person should understand their, their weaknesses that's where satan's going to come number two um, stay away from the sources of temptation recognize those things um, that tempt us is number three you know to stay away from them but to recognize what they are and don't go anywhere near them and number four practice self-restraint no one's going to set the boundaries unless you do it's something that we need to be good at. You know, there's some things I suffer from kidney stones and there's some things that I can't eat. And my doctor has told me that. And I've got to practice self-restraint. You know, as we get older, you know, if we wanted to, we could sit down over nighttime, watch TV and eat a whole packet of Tim Tams. But I know that if I do that, I'll be larger than a house within about two months. So we've got to practice self-restraint. So now I only eat half a packet of Tim Tams. But it's something that you and I have got to get good at doing. We've got to practice this self-restraint. Um, we've got to get good at it. Number five, change how we invest our time. Are we servants of righteousness? And if we're servants of righteousness, what are the good habits that form in our lives? What are the good actions or deeds that we do as a result? What are the fruit that we're producing? Change how you invest your time. Look at what are the things that you're involved in. How are you investing? Are you investing in an eternal future 
or something that's just dead and buried and gone. And number six, lean constantly on God's grace and his strength. You know what? Our bodies can be tools or instruments for evil. And if we let them, that is. So the question is, who we offer our instrument or our body to makes all the difference. You know, the, think about a laser. A laser can be used destructively or it can be put to good use. So I've got some pictures here. It can be used in the manufacturing industry and used to cut out metal and do all sorts of things and make things. It's used in the medical field to actually go into people's bodies and remove cancers and do all sorts of things and, and whatever. But it can also be used destructively. A laser can actually be used to blind someone. We've heard the stories about how they, you know, some people have done that at airports to try and blind air, airport pilots. Will we give ourselves to God to be put to good use for his glory? Slaves of righteousness. Sin used to be our master, but now that we are slaves of righteousness, bound to Christ, he is now our master. He gives us the power to do good, not evil. Without Jesus, we wouldn't have any choice. Sin would still be our master. And the results? Pain, guilt, suffering, complete separation from God. So the question that we need to ask is, are we still serving our old master? What master have we chosen? Have we chosen Christ, our new master? And the challenge here is to give ourselves wholeheartedly, not half-heartedly. Because Jesus, remember, he said, you can't serve two masters. You'll either love one and hate the other or vice versa. You'll please the other and, and not the other. Jesus said the greatest command when he was asked was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and all your strength. Notice Jesus never says, well, love the Lord your God with half your heart, half your soul, half your mind and maybe a bit of your strength. Jesus never says that. It's all in wholeheartedly. And so my question with you today is, how are you going with that? Give yourself a rating, one to ten. How are you going with that? Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. How's your rating? Is it down near one or two or is it up near nine or ten? I pray that as God is sanctifying you, creating you to be holy, that that rating is, is creeping up. You know, you can't be neutral. Every person that has ever lived has had one of only two masters, God or sin. And each one of them, as we've learned today, has consequences and when we choose God as our master, it's not that we don't or can't sin anymore. It's that we're no longer slaves to sin. We become slaves to righteousness. And we can choose between the two masters. We can choose to belong to God. We can, and, but we can also choose to belong to sin. But they don't forget, they each pay a current currency. Sin's currency is eternal death. But God's currency is a free gift. It's eternal life. If you want sin to remain as your master, then all you can ever expect out of this life without God is no hope. We see that in the world. Eternal death. That's all we can expect. However, new life with God as our master through Christ begins on this earth and it continues forever eternally with God. So what's your choice? Who's your master today? In the end, it's not much of a choice because it's actually a free gift. We can't earn it. We can't pay God back for it. God gives it to us freely. Our response is just grateful, grateful, grateful acceptance. Your and my salvation was and is a free gift from God. It was his mercy, not anything that we have done. And so my question is, who is your master today? Next week, we're going to look at Romans 7 and we are going to explore this further. We're going to look at what's called the doulos slave bound to Christ. You and I as believers make a choice to be bound to Christ and Paul wants to expand that further in Romans chapter 7. I pray that this has been helpful and useful for you today. Give us a thumbs up, like us, subscribe to us, follow. Anyway, let me pray. <clears throat> Let's pray and we'll finish for today and we'll see you next week in Romans chapter 7. Let's pray. Thank you, Father God, for the free gift of eternal life because of our acceptance of Jesus, because of the free gift that you have given to us. Yes, we struggle in our sin every day, but we're thankful that in Christ, we don't have to be slaves to it any longer. Because of the cross and the death, burial and resurrection of your son, Jesus, a solution has now been given to us.
And so our prayer today is to help each one of us to present our bodies daily as living sacrifices for your glory, that we might become slaves of righteousness, bond servants for Jesus. And we thank you for opening our minds and our hearts to your word in the book of Romans, to your scriptures today. Lead us into paths of righteousness by your Holy Spirit this week. Guide us to be who you created us to be, who you want us to be. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So next week, don't forget, Romans 7, if you've got some time this week, go and open your, your Bible, your sword, the scriptures, and have a read through Romans 7. Have another look at Romans 6. It's very complex, but have a look through it. Bound to Christ next week. That's it for today. Join us again next week for our podcast on the 20th of September. That's it from me. I'm Pastor Marshall from the Bap Cave, Laidley Baptist Church of Christ. That's it. Bye for now.